Our next speaker is Professor Khalid Har. He's a fellow of Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health of London, Edinburgh, and Ireland. He has over 52 years of experience in pediatrics and neonatology. He has published around 200 peer reviewed papers and have authored three books. He is also a foreign faculty professor of neonatology at the University of Child Health Sciences and Children's Hospital Lahore. He is going to talk about neonatal success, a continuing challenge. Professor Khalidhar. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Chairpersons, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to thank the neonatal team at the Children's Hospital for this wonderful curriculum for two days where we're discussing sepsis. Thank you for inviting me. And I sincerely apologize for not being with you in Lahore today. I also apologize that some of what I'm going to say will be a repetition of what, has, what you've already heard. And some of what I will say might be slightly different and take a different point of view from what has been expressed by the two eminent speakers earlier on. Nevertheless, I send you greetings from San Francisco, where it is just about midnight, and I have no conflict of interest and nothing to declare for this presentation. What I am going to do is it's slightly different from the previous speakers. I'm going to try and discuss with you the balance between science and art of understanding and managing neonatal sepsis. With apologies to Professor Bhutta and apologies to you, the audience, just one slide to repeat and give you the background of what we are, how important sepsis is and what we are talking about. About 49 million children get sepsis in the year. 11 million of them die. Of these, just over a quarter are neonates. And when you combine neonatal deaths from sepsis and deaths from prematurity, virtually it takes over half of all neonatal deaths. But the other points which I want to make here is that 85%, as Professor Bhutta had pointed out, 85% of deaths from sepsis occur in Asia and Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia and Africa. I can move this. Occurs here. 50% in just four countries, India, China, Pakistan, and Nigeria. But that is well known. But what is a disconnect between where sepsis occurs and where basic research on sepsis is done? Basic research on sepsis is done in North America or in Europe. So there is a very great disconnect between where sepsis actually occurs and where sepsis is investigated and basic research is done. We all know, for example, that incidence of neonatal infection or sepsis is highest in the neonatal period and so is mortality. But we often do not know is that there, is, there has been little improvement in the adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes among survivors of severe neonatal sepsis over the last three decades. This has not changed. We have heard that the mortality from sepsis has gone down, the incidence of sepsis has gone down, but actually the outcome in survivors, particularly the neurodevelopmental outcome has not changed. So what is this thing which we call sepsis? And as uh, Professor Sajid Magbul just alluded to, there is a problem with definition. There have been many definitions proposed. We proposed a de definition in 2005, but today, as of today, in May 2022, there are about 128 different definitions of neonatal sepsis in the literature. There is no consensus, but we all, agree upon that sepsis is not just a fight between pathogens and host anti-inflammatory cells. I think the most important definition or the most reasonable uh, definition is sepsis is a life-threatening multi-organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response infection. 
So there are two elements to this definition. It is the pathogen, but it is also how the host responds to that pathogen. That is what constitutes uh, sepsis. Now, the other reason why it is so difficult to diagnose or define sepsis is as Roger Bone, who was a chest physician, tried to define sepsis in adults in 1992, because sepsis is not a static thing. It is a continuum. So he ended up by defining systemic inflammatory response, sepsis as systemic inflammatory response plus infection, severe sepsis, septic shock, and multi-organ failure. We were the first uh, about 20 years ago nearly to describe fetal inflammatory response syndrome or neonatal systemic inflammatory response syndrome and gave its definition. We then defined what we think is sepsis is first plus hypotension plus single organ failure plus lactate of over five. We then described septic shock and we also then described multi-organ uh, dysfunction. So there is a definition of sort available as a continuum of, uh, of sepsis in the newborn. At the same time, in 2005, we clearly defined what early onset sepsis was, that is sepsis within the first 72 hours. Now here, with all due respects to Professor Bhutta and, and the WHO, where they still talk about uh, early onset sepsis for seven days, and some publications still do, but majority believe that early onset sepsis is within the first 72 hours, which is a vertical transmission, and late onset sepsis is beyond 72 hours. The risk factors are well known, and I do not need to go over them. They, you can find them in any textbook you, you care to look at. But the difference between early onset sepsis and late onset sepsis is not only of the time frame that early onset occurs in the first 72 hours and late onset occurs after 72 hours. They are phenotypically different. They are phenotypically different, two, like tale of two cities. They're two different cities. Early onset sepsis is infrequent, late onset sepsis is frequent. Perinatal risk factors are present in early onset sepsis. The environment, hospital associated factors are present in uh, late onset sepsis. The organisms are slightly different in the preterm and term, both in early onset and late onset sepsis. But the major difference, the major difference between the two is that early onset sepsis meningitis is infrequent. And, and therefore, there is current debate whether babies should have a lumbar puncture done if they have early onset sepsis. But in late onset sepsis, meningitis is present in more than a quarter. And therefore, it is consensus that every baby with late onset sepsis requires a lumbar puncture. Now to talk about, as I said, I'm going to talk about the balance between science and art. So to talk about science of uh, sepsis is first to understand its pathophysiology. And then it's very important to learn how does the baby himself or herself fight infection? How do we diagnose sepsis early and accurately? And I know General Salman is going to talk about it, but I'll briefly mention it. And then based on these three things, how can we improve our management of neonatal sepsis? So where does the, starting from the beginning, where do the infection come from? It is a common myth that the intrauterine environment is sterile. It is not. It has bacteria and bacterial products that may cause inflammation by themselves. Chorioaminitis, of course, is the important thing. It occurs in about nearly uh, half of uh, babies who get early onset sepsis. But something which both obstetricians and neonatologists forget to ask or look at is maternal periodontal health. Maternal gingivitis is a leading cause of asymptomatic bacteriuria and is a cause, a leading cause of intrauterine early onset infection. If you were to treat periodontal infection in 
baby in mothers who have in premature labor, you will reduce the incidence of prematurity by 6% and also incidence of infection. Of course, prolonged rupture of membrane, 12 hours or 18 hours, maternal UTI and maternal fever. Late onset sepsis, on the other hand, is entirely due to intestinal microbiome dysbiosis. That means the disturbance of the gut microbiome. And that occurs secondary to hypoxia, ischemia, or if you don't feed the baby formula milk or early or prolonged antibiotics. What happens is that the mucous membrane, mucus layer, mucus layer, which covers the epithelium of the gut is destroyed. And also uh, with an, and the interconnecting tight junctions are destroyed, allowing bacteria, pathogens, and viruses to enter into circulation circulation. Now the pathophysiology of neonatal sepsis is rather complex, but what I have done is I've tried to make as simplest cartoon I could. You have, in, and this is to deal with bacterial infection and not with fungal or viral infection because their pathophysiology is slightly different. The microbial products like endotoxins or exotoxins activate the toll-like receptors, creating a metabolic immune genomic storm. It just flourishes like nobody's business. And that is what is responsible for causing vascular, epithelial, endothelial, mitochondrial, and tissue damage by increasing apoptosis, increasing ne necrosis, and autophagy, which I'll talk about in a minute. And that is what leads to what is now well-recognized as chaos, cardiovascular, hemopoietic, apopoietic, organ dysfunction, and immune suppression, which leads to multi-organ failure and death. Now, when you have stress or when you have infection, of course, there is an increase, uh, increase in the programmed cell death. So cells die with apoptosis. There is also the toxins destroy the cells, cell membrane, and therefore the intracytoplasmic material comes out of these cells and that is called necrosis. But very many, very few people talk about autophagy. Autophagy is a process of, intracellular, of self cleaning where the intracellular products released by apoptosis and necrosis, these are degraded and then recycled. If you have normal autophagy, this will, because these are recycled, it is an anti-inflammatory response, it reduces oxidative stress and provides energy. If these cytoplasmic products are not removed or removed inefficiently as in newborns, it aggravates inflammation, uh, inflammatory response, causes immune suppression and continues with cellular damage. So autophagy is an important aspect of how the body deals with infection. Now we just heard, and the question is, how does the baby fight infection? We've just heard, and here with all my respects and apologies to Professor Sadiji Makbul, it is an entirely a myth that the baby cannot fight infection due to its immure, Im immature immune system. This is simply not true. There is clear evidence neonates can mount a robust pro-inflammatory response to infection. Just to give you a couple of examples in the next couple of slides, but just to tell you that if you and I were to get infection, a heavy infection of by 100 colony forming units per mil, we have 100% mortality. On the other hand, a baby gets 10 times that infection, 10,000 uh, colony forming units per, uh, per mil, and only 73% mortality. So the baby can fight infection. The problem is that the baby does not have enough energy to fight infection. And the natural defense systems which you and I have are ready to fight infection are all there, but perhaps not as ready to fight infection as you and I. Just to show you and prove this to you, when you have an infection, there is a pro-inflammatory response and there's an equal and opposite anti-inflammatory response. What happens in the preterm or the term infant who gets infected 
there is a much larger pro-inflammatory response and a much slower and weaker uh, uh, anti-inflammatory response, to, and it takes longer to attain hemostasis. If there is shock, this, uh, this response is even larger and it takes even longer for the hemostasis to be established. To have this and generate all this pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory response, it requires energy. And what else does it require? It requires autophagy to get rid of the waste product. And these large protein molecules and inflammatory molecules, they in themselves cause damage, so-called immunopathology. So there is a good response, but the response may be not self-serving as much as we, uh, as we think the newborn has. Now, the next question is, how do we fight infection? Is our strategy to fight infection different than the newborn? Well, we are born with our innate immunity, which is the rapid response, and the adaptive immunity, which is the slow response, which we acquire as, uh, as we grow, uh, grow. Now, we all, both the neonate and the adult, would like to avoid infection. So we, uh, as Professor Mahmoud has just said, no sp uh, skin pricks, clean environment, and things like that. We would like to avoid uh, infection. But when we get infection, our strategies are very different. The adult has an elimination strategy. And I'll discuss that in the next slide. Whilst the newborn applies a containment strategy. And there is a great difference between the two. The elimination strategy, which adults apply, is based on complete destruction and elimination of the pathogen to minimize harm from the pathogen. But the immunological cost, the pathological cost, and the energy utilization is extremely high. The newborn raises his hand and says, no, 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 I don't want that. I want containment to minimize harm from pathogens and immunopathology, but also I want to continue and grow. So that is the reason why the newborn takes a containment strategy, because it's immunological cost, pathological cost, energy cost is moderate, and it allows the baby to have some energy to continue to grow. Otherwise, the baby will die and not grow. Just to put it in a more cartoonistic, uh, but a realistic example. A world champion cyclist spends about 100 kilocalories per day cycling on a, in a race. A preterm infant needs 120 to 130 kilocalories per day just to survive. Not anything else, but just to survive. And most of this goes to the to the brain. So the preterm the pre baby requires about 20 to 30 percent more energy than this re uh, world champion cyclist requires. And to show you this is a, is a graphic I have drawn and taken it from Haverson's work. You have uh, infection, you then fight infection, and this is the energy you use to fight infection. This is the energy you use to uh, uh, provide energy to the vital organs so that they can keep functioning. And you can see that the newborn, the organ, the energy fails much earlier than in the adult, and the newborn has an organ failure, which is much earlier. But the more important thing, the more important thing is that in the adult, despite spending all this energy, some stores are left. In the newborn, on the other hand, all the stores are uh, 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 finish. And so the baby does not have any more st stores to grow and to do things. So the reason I put this is that me, some of my colleagues I have seen in Pakistan and elsewhere too, stop feeding the baby or stop giving energy, despite the fact they do not have TPN. The neonate requires more kilocalories per kilo per day due to stress of sepsis, not less. So please do not stop feeding. And that was enough of science. Let us come to the art of neonatal sepsis. The art lies in early and accurate diagnosis, recognizing and managing the chaos which I've described about, 
prevention and evidence-based specific treatment. We all try and diagnose sepsis, try to diagnose sepsis early by various methods, but in fact, as you know, the signs and symptoms and early biomarkers are all non-specific and therefore not very helpful. However, we also at the same time monitor heart rate. Some who have the facility do pulse oximetry, we monitor re respiratory rate, we monitor blood pressure, and uh, units like uh, Janaids also have uh, nerves. And so they monitor every all these parameters at this, uh, in an, any baby, particularly a preterm baby. But individually, they are not that helpful. But if you apply multi-tier analytic system, join them together so that they relate to each other and can work with each other, you will be able to diagnose sepsis correctly and predict sepsis in 95 to 97% of cases. And these multi-tier analytic systems are now available. In the lab, of course, we are doing you know, omics studies, genomics and proteomics and the metabolomics. But what I wanted, to, these are expensive and difficult tests to do. I don't want to go into them. I just want to point out that the plasma lactate, which you can do at the bedside, is a very high level of specificity and specificity for diagnosing sepsis and plasma lactate clearance as a, is, is a very important prognostic marker. And therefore, I would urge you to include a lactate in your septic screen, a lactate which you can get the answer very quickly and not two days later. Now, coming to how do we manage chaos? Of course, antibiotics are the pre uh, and the main important thing, but we should never forget that the chaos affects the brain, lung, liver, metabolism, kidneys, and the hemopoietic system, but most importantly, it, it sepsis affects the cardiovascular system. In the cardiovascular system, at the onset of sepsis, there is systemic vascular resistance increases due to vasoconstriction induced by pro-inflammatory proteins. The baby initially tries to maintain perfusion by increasing the heart rate, getting tachycardic, and increasing cardiac output by contracting more. But due to the more fibrous and less elastic cardiac muscle, it cannot sustain this response for very long. And therefore, the cardiac function is compromised. There is impaired diastolic filling, impaired coronary flow, and the cardiac output falls. When the cardiac output falls, when the cardiac output falls, the baby gets hypotensive and goes in shock. Now, on many, many ward rounds, Many of my senior and younger colleagues tell me this baby was doing perfectly well and suddenly collapsed and went into shock. Ladies and gentlemen, neonates do not suddenly go into shock. It is the clinician who suddenly notices it. Remember this, neonates do not suddenly go into shock. It is the clinician who suddenly remembers it, notices it. Now, how do we define shock? It is very difficult to define shock in the neonate because and in adults, it's easy, warm and cold shock. In the neonates, it is very difficult because the neonates keeps on fluctuating from warm shock to cold shock. But it is important to know the difference because the, the pathophysiology is different and the management is different. In warm shock, you get decreased vascular resistance. Therefore, there is vasodilatation and the treatment is vasopressors first. And while it is in cold shock, there's increased vascular resistance and you need to improve the cardiac output and so inotropes first. Of course, fluid are the basis and the key for managing shock or hypotension. Blood pressure monitoring is a poor indicator of tissue perfusion. Best is to measure perfusion index. Now it's interesting, many of you now with particularly large units use pulse oximeter, but you use it for saturation. But all pulse oximeters automatically give you a, a perfusion index, which is the figure below your saturation. I've noticed nobody notices that. 
And of course, if you have nerves, then you can do perfusion, measure perfusion better. How do we treat it? We give a bolus of normal saline. Normally, that is what most people do. I personally prefer to use ringer lactate because the pH of normal saline is 5.5, it is acid, and therefore it makes acidosis worse. If the perfusion index is still low, one, I give one more bolus, but no more. And I start adding vasopressors and um, sometimes steroids. The, I constantly reassess because I'm aware that giving boluses may cause cardiac overload, reperfusion injury, and risk of intravascular, interventricular hemorrhage. The, for decades, dopamine has been our go-to drug because, and these are three cartoons I will show you from Dr. Cole and uh, Kathy Cole and Colin's work, which is that dopamine works by squeezing the blood vessels and thus increasing the cardiac output, uh, but it also squeezes the pulmonary vessels and the vessels in the brain, and therefore it's not perhaps the ideal. And now more and more people are using nor nor norepinephrine. norepinephrine is the preferred to dopamine uh, in septic shock because of its better vasopressive uh, pressure action, anotropic action, flow distribution, and improved survival with fewer side effects. And here's the meta-analysis and the forest plot to prove that, that uh, norepinephrine is better than dopamine. So norepinephrine has become the first avenger, the first line to go uh, to treat after fluids is to give uh, norepinephrine to increase blood pressure, or, and if you want to increase cardiac output, dobutamine uh, is the heartthrob, which will increase uh, the cardiac contraction and improve your perfusion and correct your hypertension. But if they, when you are using norepinephrine and dobutamine and still you're not getting great success, then please do not wait too long and use what is now called the heart and vascular throb as the hydrocortisone. I tend to use that. I do not use dexamethasone because dexamethasone has got uh, neurological uh, complications. There are, as I said, other effects of sepsis effects on, on the lung, it causes ultra, uh, ultra pulmonary blood flow, destroys surfactant, so you might need to give surfactant, and of course it causes intrapulmonary shunting, leading to pulmonary hypertension. But a very, very interesting recent study has shown that if you give breast milk to the babies, it reduces pul pulmonary vascular resistance, i.e. reduces pulmonary hypertension, and it reduces and uh, improves ventricular function. So breast milk is not only useful for fighting infection, but is also useful for vascular tone and cardiac output. Renal dysfunction, of course, there is renal resistance and uh, leads to acute kidney injury, and therefore it needs very careful fluid management. We all know the hematological changes uh, in sepsis. There are two, there's in initially increased hemopoiesis, which then leads to exhaustion of the bone marrow and you then start getting uh, neutropenia and leukopenia and things like that. And the other is consumptive coagulopathy. But what very few people uh, pay attention to is the immunothrombosis. You know, neutrophils not only engulf bacteria, but they throw out nets to catch bacteria and in the process, they catch other cells and platelets and then block the capillaries. And this immunothrombosis continues uh, for a long time in sepsis. And that is why you get some ischemic changes in sepsis. There are of course, hormonal changes, particularly changes in the catecholamines, which are reduced uh, in, uh, and have uh, got an, uh, and, and therefore the pro-inflammatory cytokines and the pro-inflammatory response is much higher because of reduced ca catecholamines in the newborn. Similarly, vasopressin is reduced and that's why you get vasoplegia or vasodilatation. And very early on, you get the cortisol levels in sepsis are reduced and you got, get either corticosteroid insufficiency or rel relative insufficiency. And that is the reason I suggested giving hydrocortisone earlier. Two other changes, met and the metabolic changes, sepsis, sepsis increases catecholamines, increases endogenous glucose production and per, uh, 
induces peripheral insulin resistance, which leads to hyperglycemia. The protein breakdown leads to free amino acids and free fatty acids. The bottom line is that you get in sepsis, you get hyperglycemia, acidosis, hyperlactemia, and increased fatty acids, which by themselves damage the whole cells and deposit in the organs in the, like the kidney and liver. And that is why the organs fail. Last but not the least and most important, coming back to my earlier slide, that the uh, survivors, the neurocognitive behavior has not and development has not changed, is because sepsis not only involves the gut and the and the brain and the cortex, which we frequently look at, and we look at meningitis causing uh, interventricular dilatation or interventricular hemorrhage, but we don't often look at the cerebellum. Cerebellum is what is responsible for neurodevelopmental impairment, and that is affected in most infection. And here you can see in diffuse tensor imaging, the fibers between the cerebellum and the cortex are disturbed. I want to finish off by just a, uh, five or six slides of prevention. Uh, this uh, wearing gowns, having large number of people, and putting large number of babies in one unit, in one cot, or taking your shoes out does not help. As pointed out by Professor McWoon, washing hands, washing hands, washing hands is the most important thing. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But every unit should have an antimicrobial stewardship program. This is a program which promotes appropriate use of antibiotics. The reason I mention this is that Joseph Canty has just published a beautiful article of remote stewardship. Uh, that is, he monitored eight uh, neonatal units remotely uh, with steward uh, stewardship. Uh, the units were under-resourced and poor, and therefore he was able to monitor it from the center and all by just doing three things. Re rule out sepsis, there was a hard stop rule, you must stop antibiotic by 48 hours. If it's a culture proven antibiotic uh, infection, stop antibiotic for five days, even with pneumonia, stop antibiotic for five days. And he was able to reduce the use of antibiotics by 27%. Now, I see uh, Dr. Rehan sitting there and I see some military officers sitting there. Armed Forces Hospital, group of hospitals, in this group of hospitals can in inculcate and put in a, a group-wise uh, antimicrobial stewardship program. It can be monitored from one center. It, it now with telephone, it is so easy to do. And that is the reason I put this slide up. We all use antibiotics, and as I said, are the uh, main so, uh, treatment of, and in fact, in England, if you see, this is a recent paper from UK, nearly 80, 60 to 800% of babies re in the neonatal unit get antibiotics. For every infected baby in USA, six to 12 babies get antibiotics. In UK, about 10 to 15 of them. In Pakistan, in our own study, anything between 30 to 88 babies get antibiotics for one infected baby. So we use antibiotics like lollipops quite often. But when you have to use antibiotics, please use them early because for every hour delay in administration of antibiotics, mortality increases by 4%. Now, the antibiotic which you use will depend on what pathogens you see. They are not, should not, we should not follow the high income countries. We should follow uh, our own uh, low middle income countries where acetinobacter, Klebsiella are much more common. And so our antibiotics should be focused on that. Now, we have heard uh, and various antibiotic regimens. This is a very recent paper published in the Lancet from Thompson, who had in a study of 476 babies from Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Pakistan, Nigeria, and Rwanda, and South Africa, which I think Zulfi quoted. They have shown keftazidine and amikacin to be the best uh, antibiotic for empirical use. But I would caution you for using first-line keftazidine uh, should perhaps, in my view, not be the antibiotic to be used. How long do we give antibiotic? Kanti has taken it from our study. We have shown many years ago, in, actually in, 2000, in the year 2000, that is 20, uh, 
12 years ago or so more that five days of antibiotics is more, is more than enough. And there is no need, and this has been confirmed from India by Sinai in 2016. Thus, our protocol is the empiric antibiotic for 36 to 48 hours, culture proven sepsis five to seven days, whether it's gram negative or gram positive, meningitis 10 to 14 days for gram positive, 21 days for gram negative. And again, with respects to Professor McGool, we would give antibiotics for osteomyelitis for, for one week intravenously and then orally for four weeks. The problem is that if you, the longer you give antibiotics, the greater the harm. If you give antibiotics for more than seven days, number to harm comes down from 320 to 170. And then if you give it for more than 10 days, it comes down even further. The longer the antibiotic therapy, the greater the change in the gut microbiome and the likelihood of short, medium and long-term long complications like asthma, allergy and, uh, and uh, obesity. In India now, nearly more than 30% of neonatal deaths are due to antibiotic microbial resistance. Perhaps in Pakistan, it is higher. We must support nutrition and NPO, as I've said, increases gut dysbiosis, hence it can make sepsis worse. Placing, if you're not feeding and giving TPN, still please place a few drops of colostrum or breast milk because it will change the microbiome of the gut and the lungs. Breast milk has many anti-inflammatory properties. Breast milk should be the drug, um, feed, feed of choice and breast milk reduces all cause mortality and caloric intake should be maintained. Because if you get in sepsis, there is tissue catabolism. And if you do not give high energy nutrition, this metabolism, uh, catabolism of muscle and tissue will continue. So high energy nutrition is important. Adjuvant therapies, we have seen uh, these do not work. Uh, I know Professor Gupta has talked about emollients, but the, uh, in my reading of the uh, evidence, the, uh, the uh, evidence is uncertain whether they help or they don't. Uh, probiotics does not reduce much sepsis. It certainly reduces neck and certainly reduces mortality. Bovine lactoferrin does not seem to help, but there are more recent studies showing human lactoferrin helps. We have shown in the past gram negative infection is significantly reduced and uh, outcome is improved if you use uh, IgM. So what is the future? The future lies in better uh, using antimicrobial peptides, better immunotherapic agents, smart antibiotics, maternal lactoferrin, and perhaps vaccines. Eight. But having said all that, there are still many uncertainties left. Why do some babies survive and the others with similar infection die? Can we predict severity of sepsis to individualize therapy is because if one size does not fit all. The reason I've shown you these uh, zebrafish is because they share 70% of our genome. Our G and, they, and they share the genomes of sepsis. So we can study sepsis uh, in these zebra fishes. What are the real benefits of uh, breast milk components? Which components help? We do not know and we are studying that. Can artificial intelligence be a more informative marker? And adults are already using this artificial intelligence to up the volume fluid therapy and the vasopressor therapy. Can we optimize pharmacodynamics and better, better understand pharmacokinetics and dynamics of drugs in SIPS? Can we develop clear informative bedside dashboards like the multi-tier analytics uh, to improve our diagnosis? So to end, ladies and gentlemen, the summary take home message or take to work message, initial resuscitation, diagnostic tests, empirical antibiotics, not more than 48 hours, maintenance fluid, supportive treatment, high calorie intake, adjuvant possible source of microbial control, but do not forget that all infections can, may not be bacterial infections. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, once again, thank you to the organizers. These are my references and I'm open to questions. Thank you so much.